I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, standing side by side with Israel. We will always be there by your side. As Israel mobilizes its forces and aims to dismantle Hamas, the U.S. works to prevent a wider war. The country's top diplomat dispatched to Tel Aviv as he urges Israel to avoid civilian casualties while meeting with survivors of Hamas's attacks. Plus... Things are getting worse day by day, minute by minute, actually. I can say that we're just waiting for death. The impending doom for the people of Gaza, cut off and with practically no way out. And we take you to Lebanon, where fears grow of a second front in this war. And, and we're going to continue to go through this process as we grow our support, work towards getting this resolved and getting the House back open. A beacon of democracy in disarray as Republicans are unable to come together around a leader on Capitol Hill. The ripple effect it's having as the country could enter a third week with a speakerless House. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephanie Ramos. In for Lindsay Davis, thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight on day six of the war in Israel as Israel continues to pound Gaza with airstrikes after Hamas terrorists stormed the country Saturday. And on the ground inside the country, the military is still finding suspected Hamas militants. Our team was reporting in the south near the site of that music festival where the attackers first entered when suddenly authorities surrounded a suspected Hamas militant who was still there. And in Gaza, amid the relentless barrage of airstrikes, concerns about the safety of those hostages still being held by Hamas, some 130, including Americans. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in the country today telling Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu the U.S. will always have Israel's back and announcing America will send charter flights to get Americans out of Israel. Back here at home, security is being stepped up over heightened concerns about a worldwide call for terror attacks tomorrow. And we are closely watching what's happening to Israel's north and whether Hezbollah will get involved in the conflict Mola Lenghi is standing by from Beirut with more on that. But first, Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman leads us off from Tel Aviv. Tonight, we travel to the site of the deadliest Hamas massacre, the music festival where over 260 people were killed. The murderous frenzy of that day may be over, but as we see, the threat is not. Right there, come here. They found a militant right there. Keep rolling. We watch as Israeli forces subdue a suspected terrorist. There's a militant right under there. He's kneeling. His hands are on his chest. Israeli paratroopers swarming. He's being blindfolded and led away right through there. We are now in a war zone. We are now looking for all the terrorists that now hide. They don't want to go out and fight. They want to hide and keep on killing civilians. We are shown how the Hamas teams brought supplies with them into Israel. Sterile needles, yep, hand sanitizer in Arabic. Israeli forces now amassing on the edge of Gaza, preparing to invade and hunt down Hamas. We will find each and every one that did this massacre in Gaza, and we will come to him, and he will pay the price for what he did. Across the border, Palestinians already living a nightmare. Apocalyptic scenes in Gaza City pummeled by Israeli bombs. <laughs> After a missile struck this refugee camp, men scratching through the rubble with their bare hands. 300,000 Gazans now forced from their homes, this little girl crying in a stranger's arms. <laughs> She's looking for her mother, this woman says. We don't know where her mother is. Since Israel cut off food, water, and electricity to Gaza earlier this week, we've been getting regular updates from 21-year-old college student Tala Herzala. I'm literally scared. I'm, I'm terrorized. I'm threatened. Um, but this is our land, and we will never say uh, goodbye to our land. Today, another dispatch from Tala. The sound of explosions behind her. This time, toll of the war clearly etched on her face. Yesterday was very hard. There were a lot of bombings around us. One of them was 
about 150 meters from my house. And then she points the camera out the window, a body carried in the street. This is one of the funerals, she says, that we see every single day. Just devastating and heart-wrenching scenes there. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman joins us now from Tel Aviv. Matt, tell us more about that harrowing scene you and your team encountered at the music festival grounds today. I know you've been in some pretty awful situations, but what was going through your mind in that moment? It, it was a little surprising on the one hand because suddenly we saw this stream of Israeli paratroopers running towards something and it was slightly obscured at first and we didn't know what it was. Then we heard a shot and then another shot. And on the other hand, it was not very surprising, Stephanie, because we had been warned all day about possible suspected Palestinian terrorists in that area. There were reports of a guy in a paraglider, people uh, hidden underground. There were active efforts to try to locate people all over the place. So I suppose it's not surprising. And we had been warned about 20 minutes earlier by the Israeli admiral that the place appears to still be, to some degree, crawling with Palestinian militants. So it was both very surprising to actually witness it myself, and on the other hand, not so surprising that that's the case. Um, the idea is that Israel has managed to plug the holes in its barrier with Gaza, but has not been been able to find all of the Palestinian terrorists who've managed to infiltrate on Saturday into the Israeli side of the border. Just incredible that, that you were able to witness that. And Matt, we are of course thinking about the hostages who were kidnapped and taken across the border by Hamas. Now, that situation for them, it has to be so dire given the conditions in Gaza deteriorating so quickly. Well, first, Israel is pummeling Gaza from the air, as we know, with those aerial bombardments. Second, we know that a number, possibly a large number, of those hostages are wounded. Um, Hirsch Goldberg, the son of Rachel Goldberg Pollen, uh, we're told he had his arm blown off by a grenade. He was a medic in the military when he was younger, and he put a tourniquet on himself. We understand many of them could be hurt, including Americans. We understand there are Americans among the hostages, and American intelligence agencies are working alongside their Israeli counterparts. And Stephanie, this is an incredibly unique thing. It's a massive hostage situation in the middle of a very active war zone. And one thing that Israeli Admiral I talked to in the piece made very clear, Israel has no intention of slowing slowing or stopping its attack on Gaza at this point. Stephanie. Matt, thank you so much. Thank you and your team for your tireless reporting. We really appreciate it. Be safe, please. Let's bring in Bushra Khalidi, the policy lead at Oxfam. That's an organization dedicated to trying to end poverty in Gaza and around the world. Bushra is in the West Bank right now. And Bushra, thank you so much for your time. I understand that you have family that's in Gaza right now. Your husband's parents are in Gaza and you also have a lot of friends that are there. What are they telling you? My nephews, all they've known is their young lives is a blockade and wars. Um, and this is just another recurrent reality, but 10 times more intense. Families have told us that they sleep together so that they can die together. Um, many of our family friends have lost their homes. And to be frank, we've stopped counting. Um, entire neighborhoods have been wiped out. People can't leave their home because there's so much rubble on the street because um, of the level of destruction. There's no shelter in Gaza. Um, all the crossings are closed. Even those designated shelters, they're not fit or adequate to shelter people. We've just heard the Shifa hospital doesn't have any space in its morgue, in the morgue anymore. And so it's parking bodies outside of the hospital. Um, there's many bodies under the rubble. Um, people have told us, my family friends have told us that they that they've heard body people scream for help under the rubble with medical act teams unable to access them because of the level of destructions on the streets, cars can't drive. One colleague um, shared with me that every day his son asks him um, if he's going to die. Um, remember that Gaza is a very young population, almost half of Gaza. Half of 2.2 million people are, are children. It's just, it's just a devastating situation. They've lost hope. They've basically lost hope. 
Your yeah. organization tries to end poverty. And what are they doing right now in the region, in Gaza, or I mean, wherever they, wherever they can work? What are they doing right now? I mean, right now we're trying to locate our staff. This is our number one priority. Uh, it's virtually impossible to reach any affected com um, uh, communities. The bombardment is near constant. There is um, uh, an imminent uh, ground inv invasion. I mean, if that happens, um, even humanitarian corridors um, that uh, a lot of organizations are calling for um, are going to have to be rethought completely in their entirety. I mean, as an international community, we have forewarned um, of the humanitarian crisis uh, for years, actually. Um, we have been responding in Gaza for the last 50, 10 years. Um, at each escalation, we respond, and we have been uh, uh, warning the international community that the humanitarian situation in Gaza is at a brink. Talk about the situation in the West Bank right now. How has that been since Saturday's attack? I mean, thank you for asking, because of course, you know, the world and so have uh, us, we've been focused on, um, on, on Gaza, but um, today uh, there were, only today, there were 40 settler um, uh, related violence um, incidents in the West Bank. Uh, there's already been over 20 um, uh, Palestinian killed by either uh, armed settlers or uh, Israeli forces since last Saturday. Um, we are on full uh, military lockdown. Uh, there are 640 checkpoints across the West Bank, meaning that we can't leave or enter the cities. Uh, we can't go to another city. We have to stay in Ramallah. Um, uh, the situation is extremely tense. Bushra, we hope that all of this is resolved soon for you and your family and everyone else that is there in the West Bank, in Israel, and in Gaza. Again, thank you so much for your time and for sharing with us. We want to keep in touch with you, and we wish you well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. From Great Britain to Egypt to Israel, the Gaza Strip and its people have been occupied or militarized for more than a century. And now under the control of Hamas and relentless bombardment by Israel, its existence may be in jeopardy. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel takes us inside uh, this small piece of land described by human rights organizations as a, quote, open air prison. <laughs> For six long days, Israel has been bombing Gaza. Building by building, neighborhood by neighborhood, town by town, collapsing. More than 1,500 Palestinians have been killed since last Saturday, and thousands more injured. An entire population besieged, with few places to go. For many families, this is now what passes for home. Khan Yunus Hospital in Gaza, where men, women, and so many young children now sleep and shelter from the incessant bombing. It's a massacre. Uh, uh, they are wiping out entire neighborhoods. They are wiping out their families. Um, over their, they're bombing, bombing uh, families. Tala Hatsala is one of more than two million Gazans trapped, unable to escape the bombing and under siege. I'm literally shaking. I can't say anything. I'm, I'm really shaking. This was Tala one week ago, a bright young student full of ambition and dreams. Her Instagram posts speak to a life that's now slipped away. Today, Tala's like everyone else here, caught in the crossfire of a war she didn't choose and can't escape from. The situation is, is very hard. Uh, no words can describe what we are living right now. Things are getting worse day by day, minute by minute. I can say that we're just waiting for death. This morning, she looked out of her window and saw the funeral of a neighbor. There were a lot of bombings around us. We were surprised. By one of my neighbor's funeral, about 25. He was working in his own market buying nuts for people. When the Israeli airstrikes decided to bomb them without any warning. 
Israel says it's hitting what it calls terror targets, destroying Hamas arms depots, its infrastructure, and targeting the homes of its leaders. Retaliation for that horrific attack last Saturday that killed more than 1,200 Israelis, with dozens more abducted. Israel declaring war, promising a punishing campaign. The Israeli defense minister imposing a complete siege on Gaza. The options are, are, are virtually zero. The Gaza, the, the entire Gaza Strip, it is totally uh, uh, walled off by Israel on all sides and Egypt on, an, on, on one side. Both uh, are tightly controlled. Uh, needless to say, uh, Israel is not an option. I mean, leaving via the Israeli checkpoint is not an option. Even during uh, normal times, very few people in Gaza uh, have permission to leave. Israeli defense forces say the emphasis is on damage, not accuracy. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu advising people to leave Gaza. But Israel also bombed the last open border crossing into Egypt this week. And for Gazans, there is no way of leaving. About the size of Philadelphia, the Gaza Strip was handed from Ottoman to British to Egyptian control until 1967, when the Six-Day War erupted. Israel seizing control of the Palestinian territories of Gaza, the West Bank, and Golan Heights. By the 1980s, as Palestinian anger over Israeli occupation grew, Hamas emerged as an offshoot to the Egyptian-based Muslim Brotherhood. One key goal of the militant Islamic group, the eradication of Israel. Despite a brief period of peace, Hamas continued to assail Israel with suicide bombers and other deadly attacks. When they took control of Gaza in 2007, Israel and Egypt imposed a blockade that partially sealed off Gaza from the outside world. Today, with over two million residents, the Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated areas on Earth. Two-thirds of the population is under 25 years old, and 80% are living in poverty. With support from Iran, Hamas began launching periodic rocket attacks into Israel. Israel responding in turn with airstrikes and even ground troops at times. But tensions have escalated further recently, fueled by an increasingly right-wing Israeli government. Expansion of Jewish settlements on Palestinian land in the West Bank. Deadly raids against militants in Palestinian towns, and in particular, raids at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. It's one of the most holy sites in Islam, but also venerated in Judaism as the Temple Mount. We feel a lot of violence in our life. Uh, people burned, um, prisoners who receive all types of tortures you can imagine. We are besieged for more than 17 years. All conditions here is bad, are bad. We don't have any chance to do anything. We don't have any chance to, to make life better. Last Saturday's bloody attack in Israel named the Al-Aqsa Flood, bringing decades of conflict to a head and what could prove to be a critical tipping point for the region. What do people expect Gazans to feel? Gaza is literally a, a pressure cooker and uh, people are pushed into a corner. They've been pushed into a corner for the past 16 years. Gaza is now without power. Water, electricity, food supplies cut and overwhelmed hospitals that struggle to deal with the wounded. In seeking to prevent this kind of appalling attack ever happening again, Israel wants to wipe Hamas off the face of the earth. But as we've seen before, the actions of the few are unlikely to be stopped by the punishment of the many. It's now dark, again, dark again, night again, uh, terror again. I dream to Gaza to, to be free, to Palestine actually to be free. I dream that we all can come and go back to our homes. 
Our thanks to Ian for breaking down the complicated history in that region. Israel also faces a threat from the north. Tens of thousands of troops have been dispatched to the border near Lebanon, where another group, Hezbollah, is based. The group is Iran-backed and designated as terrorists by the U.S. Israel is now sending troops toward its northern border as the situation escalates. For the latest, let's bring in our Mola Lenghi, who is in Beirut, Lebanon. Mola, what's the latest on troop movement to the northern border of Israel? Well, Stephanie, as you mentioned, Israel uh, deploying tens of thousands of troops to its northern border that it shares with Lebanon, where Hezbollah, the Iranian-backed uh, militia, has threatened to attack. Now, there has been uh, some missile fire back and forth between the two sides, between Hezbollah and Israel on the border this week. The concern, of course, is that those skirmishes, those clashes could escalate into a broader regional conflict. The U.S. has deployed a aircraft carrier into the region, the USS Ford. It is the largest in the uh, U.S. naval fleet. In fact, it's uh, one of the largest warships uh, on the entire planet uh, in the hopes of uh, deterring not only Hezbollah, but by proxy, Iran from entering this conflict. And Mola, has Lebanon seen any damage? Well, there has been some damage in these skirmishes uh, to both sides in the exchange uh, of missile fire. Hezbollah uh, taking aim at Israeli defense positions, Israel shelling several uh, small towns in southern Lebanon, both sides appearing uh, to focus on uh, milita military targets. Uh, up to this point, those skirmishes uh, appear to have been localized, the damage uh, isolated. But again, there is that concern over escalation, Stephanie. And Mola, let's talk a little bit about the implications to the region. What are the implications for Israel and for the region if this war develops on multiple fronts? Yeah, it's difficult to, to overstate how volatile uh, the situation is here. Other countries uh, potentially getting uh, dragged in to the conflict. Uh, if Hezbollah were to uh, engage uh, militarily, uh, Israel, uh, if Hezbollah were to engage with Israel uh, militarily, uh, all of a sudden Israel would be fighting a war really on uh, on two fronts. So, And beyond that, uh, you've got the regional implications here. Uh, you have other groups that are uh, affiliated with Hezbollah throughout the region, other Iranian-backed Shia military groups uh, in Iraq and Syria uh, and Yemen. Uh, what role would they play? How far would Iran then wade into this and, and to what degree? And of course, uh, the U.S. would be asking itself a question and all the other regional players, the regional powers, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, what role would all of these countries uh, play in an escalating conflict? So the implications, the broad implications are very concerning for a lot of these countries. It certainly is, and the situation could get so much more complicated. Mola, thank you so much for that perspective from Beirut. Thank you. Please be safe. Now to the White House and a rare response to something former President Trump said last night about that terror group in Lebanon, Hezbollah. Trump calling the group, quote, smart. Let's bring in ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Mary, what is the White House saying tonight? Well, Stephanie, the White House rarely responds to Trump's comments, but tonight they are calling him out, saying these remarks are dangerous and unhinged. And the White House is trying to draw a sharp contrast here, saying they are focused on trying to help Israel during this crisis and trying to prevent a wider war, while the Republican frontrunner, the former president, is criticizing Israeli officials and praising an Iranian-backed terrorist organization. Stephanie? Mary Bruce at the White House for us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. And amid this war and all of this uncertainty, here in the U.S., security is being stepped up. ABC News has confirmed every major city police department in the country is now on heightened alert amid concerns of threats against synagogues and houses of worship. The FBI says they are aware of open source reporting about the national call for action by Hamas, and they are working with their counterparts with state and local law enforcement. Our senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky reports from New York on the concern and what authorities are now doing. Tonight, police across the country are on high alert after online calls for a global day of action tomorrow. No justice, no peace. There have been peaceful demonstrations nationwide since that horrific Hamas attack, and federal officials say they know of no specific plans for violence in the United States. But Attorney General Merrick Garland telling President Biden today they're watching for any sign of a terror threat here at home. 
In New York, the NYPD is calling in extra personnel and telling officers to be prepared to work 12-hour shifts. We're trying to make sure that violence doesn't manifest on the streets of New York City. Police in other major cities have been talking to synagogues, religious schools, and other potential targets and closely monitoring demonstrations to make sure things remain peaceful. Stephanie, tonight Israel is warning of possible attacks on Israelis and Jews abroad. In fact, an Israeli student here at Columbia University was hit with a stick as he was putting up flyers around campus. Now campus is closed. They've shut the gates to all but outsiders as an added measure of security. Stephanie. Aaron, thank you so much. And tonight we bring you more of our in-depth reporting on the ground in Israel and Gaza during our half-hour special brought to you by our reporting team on the ground there. That's Matt Gutman, Ian Panel, and James Longman. We'll remain on top of the developments out of Israel and Gaza throughout the night, but there is still much more news to get to here on Prime. A surprise for Ford in the auto strike, and SAG-AFTRA gives an update on negotiations for a new contract. The latest as these major labor strikes continue. But next, the battle over the next Speaker of the House. Does anyone have enough votes yet to be sure of a win? Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. We turn now to the battle for House Speaker. Now nine days since Kevin McCarthy was ousted. Republicans met again today behind closed doors as Congressman Steve Scalise sought to win over holdouts to give him enough votes to win the Speaker's gavel. But he is not there yet. Let's bring in ABC's senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. And Rachel, wow, here we are again. Break down what happened today and where do things stand at this hour? Well, Stephanie, dysfunction, utter chaos, circus. Those are a few words that Republicans have told me describing what is happening here in the House. The House is now at a standstill. We are day nine without a Speaker of the House, and Republicans do not appear to be anywhere closer to electing a new speaker. They do have a nominee, Congressman Steve Scalise, but he doesn't have the votes right now. In fact, Republicans huddled behind closed doors for the fourth day in a row. They had met for nearly 12 hours this week, and Scalise left with fewer votes than he had when he actually walked in. So the opposition against him is actually growing at this point. And it's unclear what the path forward is from here. You have certain Republicans who are sounding the alarm, saying that this sends the wrong message as we're just about a month away from another government shutdown. You have the crisis unfolding in Israel, and you have some vulnerable Republicans in districts that Biden won that say they want to get back to work for their constituents. But this party is still deeply divided on a way forward. Seth.
Stephanie. And we will be watching. We know you'll be right there following it all along for us. Rachel, thank you so much. For the latest on the battle for House Speaker, I'm joined now by Republican Congressman Matt Rosendale of Montana, one of eight Republicans who voted to oust then-Speaker McCarthy last week. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Stephanie. So you've said you backed Congressman Jim Jordan for speaker in the conference vote yesterday, but after Congressman Steve Scalise won the majority, you say you'll support him on the floor. So what is your message to your colleagues who say they still won't back him over Jim Jordan? Well, uh, when we had the conference today, at the conclusion of that conference, after everyone had basically voiced their opinion, a lot of folks uh, voiced their support for either Jim Jordan or for uh, Steve Scalise. At the end of it, um, Steve said, look, anyone who still has reservations or any kind of opposition to me serving as speaker, let's go ahead, take a recess right now, and bring folks together in my office so that we can have some discussions about, about what your reservations are, what your concerns are to see if I cannot earn your support. Um, at the very beginning of the meeting, uh, Jim stood up, who I hold in extremely high regard, and he said that he did not get as many votes as uh, Steve Scalise did yesterday, which was uh, shared with uh, all of the media, and that he was absolutely comfortable with supporting Steve Scalise as the next Speaker of the House of Representatives. And so, look, my colleagues, they have individual concerns or Reservations. I think that they should be able to uh, sit down with Steve and, and work through those so that we can get him seated uh, as the next speaker and begin our work, which is critically important to uh, finish the appropriation bills. I mean, we've got like 36, 37 days left uh, before this CR expires. And Congressman, during that meeting, was it discussed uh, at all uh, Scalise's health and his, you know, as he battles blood cancer? Was that something that, that came up? And should it be a concern uh, if, given the importance of the job of House Speaker? A couple of members actually brought it up, and Steve uh, walked them through what his, the, um, his condition was, and what the prognosis was, and what the treatment was. And um, he's been through, quite frankly, more difficult challenges than that when he was shot on a ball field by a lunatic who was trying to push the leftist agenda. Um, and he came through that stronger, and Steve looks good. He's, um, he, he has shared with us his, his personal health. And and I feel like he's uh, in a strong enough position to go forward and, and serve as speaker. Congressman, you said in your statement that you believe Scalise will, quote, be able to unite the conference, but that doesn't really seem to be the case right now. But bottom line, do you think he can close the deal and get the support he needs? And if not, where does this go next? Yeah, so that, that, I mean, that truly is the question. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of meetings over the next 6 to 12 hours to see if he cannot bring everyone together. And at that point, the conference will um, meet again. Uh, we don't have the exact time yet. And then they're going to have to start making some decisions, whether he is going to be able to bring everyone together or whether we do have to pick another path forward. But I, I certainly believe that the, uh, the conference aired out a lot of their concerns today. And and I, I saw a man who was willing to sit down and discuss those concerns and uh, privately with the individuals to take the time and care necessary to dissuade those reservations. Do you think the vote should just go to the floor and just have it out on the floor and see which man gets the most votes? Um, I'm, I'm sort of torn both ways about that. I think if you go out to the floor, uh, you basically have an arm wrestling match, and I don't know if that is the most healthy thing to do. Uh, we saw how that played out in January, and while we had a, a conclusion that we came to, uh, we, it ended up landing us where we are today, quite frankly. So I don't know that an arm wrestling match of political power is the way to resolve this. Um, so it very well may be the best way for us to uh, accomplish this or to, to sort this out is in the privacy of the conference. All right, we will watch it all play out. Congressman Matt Rosendale of Montana, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me on, Stephanie. New trouble tonight for embattled Senator Bob Menendez. Federal prosecutors have filed fresh charges against the New Jersey Democrat and his wife, Nadine Menendez, accusing them of giving sensitive government information to Egypt. 
Just last month, the couple were indicted on corruption-related offenses, accused of accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars in bribes in exchange for the senator's influence. A trial date has been set for May. Both Menendez and his wife have pleaded not guilty. A jury in Colorado has found one officer guilty of criminally negligent homicide and assault in the third degree death of 23-year-old Elijah McLean back in 2019. Another officer was found not guilty on three charges, including reckless manslaughter. McLean died after being stopped by police on his way home from a convenience store. This was back in August of 2019 after a passerby called 911 to report him. The prosecution argued that the two officers violated department protocol by using excessive force against McLean and that they failed to de-escalate that situation. Still ahead, the former girlfriend of an embattled crypto founder testifies in court. What she says Sam Bankman Freed ordered her to do to keep a hedge fund afloat. And we return to the major developing story Israel at war. It was an hours long ordeal, sending people running and resulting in more than 200 deaths. We go through a detailed timeline of the Hamas attack on a music festival. But next, the latest report shows inflation is still on the rise, but not nearly as much as last year. We'll take a look at what it means for your wallet by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden, please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3.
What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. The latest report on inflation is out, and while it has some good news, American consumers are still feeling the pinch of rising prices. Let's take a look by the numbers. The new consumer price index shows prices were 3.7% higher in September compared to a year ago, and up 0.4% from a month ago. That's slightly more than expected. The biggest factor, rising prices for shelter with home and rent costs up 7.2% compared to last year, according to the Labor Department. And the average rate for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage now stands at 7.57%, making it increasingly difficult for Americans looking to move or buy their first home. But the White House touted the latest economic data, noting that overall, inflation is down 60% from its peak, while unemployment has remained below 4% for 20 months in a row. Many Americans, however, are still feeling pressure from rising prices. Food costs were up 3.7% from a year ago, and the typical household is spending about $235 more per month to buy the same goods and services as a year ago, and $734 extra compared to two years ago. That's according to Moody's Analytics. But there will be one bit of help for the 71 million Americans who receive Social Security. The government announced today they'll see a 3.2 percent increase in their checks next year as cost of living adjustment which averages out to about $59 extra per month for retired workers. Every little bit helps. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime, including more on Israel at war. With so much devastation, the need for aid is so great. We speak to Mercy Chefs about how they're hoping to fill the need for food in the most hard-hit communities. And the operation to rescue a dog trapped in a cave with a bear. How a team was finally able to get him out. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. More fallout for major companies as labor strikes continue and even expand. The new developments on charges after the death of a football fan following a game and the attempts to rescue a dog trapped in a cage with a bear. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. United Auto Workers widening the walkout against Detroit's Big Three. 8,700 members on strike at Ford's truck plant in Kentucky consider the company's most profitable facility. The union cites a lack of progress in contract talks as a reason for the latest walkout. Ford says the decision by UAW to strike at its Kentucky truck plant without warning is, quote, grossly irresponsible. 
Sam Bankman frieds former girlfriend returned to the stand for cross-examination today in the FTX fraud trial. Caroline Ellison, who was also the CEO of Bankman frieds crypto hedge fund, Alameda Research, has testified about how Bankman fried had her pull money from FTX customer accounts to fund Alameda. She previously spoke about how Bankman fried pressured her to do things she knew were wrong and how he didn't think rules like don't lie or don't steal applied to him. Ellison pled guilty to fraud and conspiracy in the case. Last month's bus crash in Orange County, New York, killed two people and injured a number of high school students. Now the National Transportation Safety Board says the bus left the right lane on I-84, crossed to the left lane and shoulder before crashing through a roadside barrier and falling downhill. The accident ejected two adults sitting in the front and the driver. The two adults killed, the driver seriously injured. That bus was headed from Farmingdale, New York to a Pennsylvania band camp. Negotiations have broken down between the Screen Actors Guild and studios as the months-long Hollywood strike continues. The Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers said talks with SAG-AFTRA had been suspended after the actor's latest proposal Wednesday, saying the gap between them was too great and, quote, conversations were no longer moving them in a productive direction. Negotiations restarted on October 2nd. The strike has been in effect since July 14th. Police in Massachusetts say they're looking to charge three suspects in connection with an altercation at a Patriots game that led to another man collapsing and dying afterward. 53-year-old Dale Mooney was pronounced dead at a local hospital after the September 17th altercation at Gillette Stadium. Foxboro police said detectives reviewed witness interviews and video of the incident and applied for criminal complaints against the three unnamed suspects, alleging assault and battery as well as disorderly conduct. Preliminary autopsy results suggested Mooney had a medical issue, but no traumatic injury. The police say his final cause of death is still undetermined. Crews in Tennessee managed to rescue a trapped dog stuck in a cave with a bear. Various Sevier County departments worked to free Charlie the dog, who was trapped three days, 40 feet down a narrow cave shaft. At first, a firefighter tried pulling the dog out Tuesday, but found a 200-pound bear sleeping inside. Officials used trail cameras to watch when the bear left. They came back the next day, rescued Charlie, and reunited him and his owner. It was the first sign of the terrors to come. The Hamas attack on the Supernova Music Festival in Israel, just a few miles away from the border of Gaza, killed more than 200 people on Saturday. The death and destruction in a space meant to celebrate music was an hours-long ordeal that sent civilians running for their lives. ABC News senior reporter Emmanuel Saliba takes us through the terror of that day in a timeline that helps us understand how it all unfolded. We do want to warn you, this may be difficult to watch. On Saturday, October 7th, 2023, Hamas militants launched an unprecedented attack on Israel, pillaging, kidnapping, killing civilians across several towns. And one of the first targets was this music festival held in the desert in southern Israel. With an estimated 260 people killed, it's being called the worst civilian massacre in Israel's history. ABC News interviewed witnesses, analyzed dozens of eyewitness videos along with security footage to piece together what we know so far. It's just before dawn on Saturday, October 7th, and about three miles from the fence that divides Israel from the Gaza Strip, an all-night music festival is underway. Thousands still dancing, unaware of the attack about to unfold. 6.29 a.m., Milet and her friends are dancing at another smaller stage. 6.30 a.m., festival attendee captures this. Rockets streaking through the sky, some partygoers stop and notice. Moments later, this video is taken from the camping area. Music has stopped, and some festival goers appear to be standing around confused. Concert goers duck for cover, some start to leave the main stage area. Other attendees, like Ben Schlosh, head back towards their cars located in one of the main parking lots. And then gunfire. He captures it on his phone. By 7 a.m. local time, Ben Schlosh tells ABC News traffic is blocking the dirt roads leading out of the festival. He says he saw Hamas militants 
on motorcycles heading in the direction shortly after gunfire erupted. Around 7.30 a.m., some concert goers decide to leave their cars behind. Gunfire is ongoing. Hamas militants are shooting at concert goers. Police officers appear to try to hold back Hamas terrorists on the highway. As the festival massacre is unfolding, Hamas militants are on camera attacking military bases and killing civilians in nearby communities. Around 8 a.m. local time, some attendees flee on foot. Gunfire rings in the background. In one of the nearby fields, hundreds run for cover. Milet is among those concert goers, and so is Shira. This is their footage. It's just after 8.30 a.m., and one concert goer, Ben Rudaev, who survived, is hiding here, in a nearby forest. Gunfire ringing in the background. Some attendees were able to survive by hiding in bushes and lying on the ground. An off-duty Israeli soldier who was at the festival captures this footage from the main highway. Police officers and others are trying to hold back Hamas militants. Civilians shelter behind this Israeli tank. He says the Israeli soldier inside the tank was eventually killed. Local police, armed with what appears to be only handguns, try to do what they can to protect concert goers from incoming fire. 9.15 a.m., Ben Rudaev and his friends are still hiding in the forest. Meanwhile, this dash cam footage captures a militant firing his rifle before dragging away what appears to be a bloodied civilian. And soon after, another militant is seen shooting a civilian lying on the ground. The time code says it's around 9.20 a.m. and these markers in the background match up with other footage from the festival grounds. Just after 10 a.m., Ben and his friend capture footage of smoke emerging from the festival site. They decide to make a run for it back to their car. As they drive away using this dirt road to get to the main highway, they realize it is blocked by burnt cars. They abandon their car and head out on foot. They would wait in a field about three miles from the festival, before eventually being rescued from a nearby gas station by the Israeli army. Milet and her friends would also survive by waiting in a nearby field, eventually rescued by Good Samaritans. Family members confirmed to ABC News that some of their loved ones attending the festival were taken hostage. Loved ones like 25-year-old Noah Argamani, who is seen here, taken away on a motorbike by Hamas militants, her boyfriend being marched alongside by foot. And Hirsch Goldberg Poland was hiding in a bomb shelter when witnesses told his parents Hamas militants threw grenades in the shelter, critically injuring the 23-year-old. Some survivors will later describe waiting hours before being rescued. Around noon, Shira and other attendees make it out on the back of a pickup truck. This drone footage posted online shows the aftermath. Burned and abandoned cars. And if you look at the road, it just is testament to the ferocity of what happened here. You can see this whole area down here is just full of bullet casings. At least 260 bodies were recovered from the concert site Sunday, according to Zaka, a volunteer emergency response group in Israel. According to the Gaza Ministry of Health, Israeli airstrikes retaliating for the Hamas attack have killed more than 1,300 people, including 91 children and over 6,000 wounded. At least 1,200 Israelis have been killed across the country and 2,900 injured, the Israeli health services confirmed. 
Humanitarian aid is pouring into the area, some of it coming from Mercy Chefs, an organization very well known stateside for its work providing chef prepared food to communities devastated by natural disasters. Joining us now from Israel is the organization's vice president, Carl Ladd. Carl, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Most of your team is in Israel right now, preparing more than a thousand hot meals a day. Your team just got there yesterday. How big of a need are you seeing in Israel right now? Yeah, first off, thanks for having us. Um, the need here is significant. Um, you know, Israel is a small country and it's a tight knit community. So there's there's the physical and there's the practical needs. Um, you know, we, we have the honor of serving fresh, delicious, hot meals, um, which honestly serve multiple needs. It serves the, the practical, physical need of, of filling people's stomachs. Um, but a quality meal also gives them an opportunity, opportunity for their heart to, to have um, some healing as, as well and to have a moment of uh, normality and to be able to breathe and, and connect as a family or with their neighbors. I'm sure having that food gives them a little bit of hope that there could be some resolve in all of this and, and some positive coming out of this at some point. Can you describe yeah. what conditions look like there right now on the ground? Yeah, um, everybody is on edge. Um, you know, everybody is kind of waiting for what's next. Um, the siren, air alarm, raid alarms are going off constantly. Alerts on people's phones. There's there's real things happening and coming in, and and you know, explosions happening in the sky from the Iron Dome. And then there's also all the the fake stuff that comes in, all the false alarms that come in that that still cause all the same emotion and fear and and trauma resurging in people. Now, part of your work is dependent on finding kitchens in the area, and you're also delivering groceries. Yeah. I mean, it, with so much destruction in those surrounding areas and security being so delicate, mm -hmm. how are you managing to feed so many people there on the ground? Yeah, it's it's thanks to our local partners, you know, and that's our model is to, to come in and link arms with the local community that's that's serving their neighbors um, and how can we pour in and invest into them so that they're better equipped um, to serve their own communities um, and and that's honestly it allows us to do our job better um, and to, allow, to cook local local food um, with local chefs and so it's a beautiful thing that, that honestly we get the privilege to, to witness is, is really neighbors helping neighbors. Absolutely, I'm sure people there that you're interacting with find some comfort in, in seeing you and seeing your team. Now for people here at home who may want to help with your work there, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, thank you. Um, obviously everything we do is, is based on the generosity of our donors and, and uh, the individuals that choose to partner with us. And so financial contributions are huge. Um, you can follow us on, on our social medias, Mercy Chef, um, or our webpage is mercychef.com. Um, and, and honestly, supporting Israel is huge right now. Standing with them, you know, encouraging them. You, you mentioned us being here as an encouragement to the people here. It absolutely is. We get, we get you know, people with tears in their eyes just saying, thank you for being here. Thank you. And thank your country. That's very well said. Carl, thank you so much for what you're doing and for speaking with us. What you're doing is literally the epitome right. of selfless service. So thank you and your team. Thank you. I appreciate that. We're honored to be here. Thanks for your time. That is our show for this hour. Thank you for sharing your time with us. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, our team coverage continues as the death toll rises in both Israel and Gaza. The takedown today of a suspected Hamas militant and the outpouring of support for Israel in the U.S. And hundreds of security forces going door to door. Who they're searching for and why critics say it's harming thousands of innocent people. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live.
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, OK? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode where Wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephanie Ramos and for Lindsay Davis. Thank you for streaming with us. We begin tonight on day six of the war in Israel as Israel continues to pound Gaza with airstrikes after Hamas terrorists stormed the country Saturday and on the ground inside the country. The military is still finding suspected Hamas militants. Our team was reporting in the south near the site of that music festival where the attackers first entered when suddenly authorities surrounded a suspected Hamas militant who was still there. And in Gaza, amid the relentless barrage of airstrikes, concerns about the safety of those hostages still being held by Hamas, some 130 people, including Americans. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in the country today telling Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu the U.S. will always have Israel's back and announcing America will send charter flights to get Americans out of Israel. Back here at home, security is being stepped up over heightened concerns about a worldwide call for terror attacks tomorrow. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman leads us off from Tel Aviv. Tonight, we travel to the site of the deadliest Hamas massacre, the music festival where over 260 people were killed. The murderous frenzy of that day may be over, but as we see, the threat is not. Right there, come here. No picture, no photo. They found a militant right there. Keep rolling. We watch as Israeli forces subdue a suspected terrorist. There's a militant right under there. He's kneeling. His hands are on his chest. Israeli paratroopers swarming. He's being blindfolded and led away right through there. We are now in a war zone. We are now looking for all the terrorists that now hide. They don't want to go out and fight. They want to hide and keep on killing civilians. We are shown how the Hamas teams brought supplies with them into Israel. Sterile needles, yep. 
The hand sanitizer in Arabic. Israeli forces now amassing on the edge of Gaza, preparing to invade and hunt down Hamas. We will find each and every one that did this massacre in Gaza, and we will come to him, and he will pay the price for what he did. Across the border, Palestinians already living a nightmare. Apocalyptic scenes in Gaza City pummeled by Israeli bombs. After a missile struck this refugee camp, men scratching through the rubble with their bare hands. 300,000 Gazans now forced from their homes, this little girl crying in a stranger's arms. She's looking for her mother, this woman says. We don't know where her mother is. Since Israel cut off food, water, and electricity to Gaza earlier this week, we've been getting regular updates from 21-year-old college student Tala Herzala. I'm literally scared. I'm, I'm terrorized. I'm pregnant. Um, but this is our land, and we will never say uh, goodbye to our land. Today, another dispatch from Tala, the sound of explosions behind her. This time, toll of the war clearly etched on her face. Yesterday was very hard. There were a lot of bombings around us. One of them was about 150 meters from my house. And then she points the camera out the window, a body carried in the street. This is one of the funerals, she says, that we see every single day. Such devastating scenes. Our thanks to Matt. From Great Britain to Egypt to Israel, the Gaza Strip and its people have been occupied or militarized for more than a century. And now under the control of Hamas and relentless bombardment by Israel, its existence may be in jeopardy. ABC News chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel takes us inside this small piece of land described by human rights organizations as, quote, open air prisons. <laughs> For six long days, Israel has been bombing Gaza. Building by building, neighborhood by neighborhood, town by town, collapsing. More than 1,500 Palestinians have been killed since last Saturday, and thousands more injured. An entire population besieged with few places to go. For many families, this is now what passes for home. Khan Yunus Hospital in Gaza, where men, women, and so many young children now sleep and shelter from the incessant bombing. It's a massacre. Uh, uh, they are wiping out entire neighborhoods. They are wiping out their families. Um, over there, they're bombing, bombing uh, families over their heads. Tala Hatsala is one of more than two million Gazans trapped, unable to escape the bombing and under siege. And I'm literally shaking. I, I can't say anything. I'm, I'm really shaking. This was Tala one week ago, a bright young student full of ambition and dreams. Her Instagram posts speak to a life that's now slipped away. Today, Tala's like everyone else here caught in the crossfire of a war she didn't choose and can't escape from. The situation is, is very hard. Uh, no words can describe what we are living right now. Things are getting worse day by day, minute by minute. I can say that we're just waiting for death. This morning, she looked out of her window and saw the funeral of a neighbor. There were a lot of bombings around us. We were surprised by one of my neighbor's funeral, about 25. He was working in his own market buying nuts for people when the Israeli airstrikes decided to bomb them without any warning. Israel says it's hitting what it calls terror targets, destroying Hamas arms depots, its infrastructure, and targeting the homes of its leaders retaliation for that horrific attack last Saturday that killed more than 1,200 Israelis, with dozens more abducted. Israel declaring war, promising a punishing campaign. The Israeli defense minister imposing a complete siege on Gaza. In Hashmal, in Mazon, 
אין מים, אין דלק. הכל סגור. אנחנו נלחמים בחיות אדם, ואנחנו נוהגים בהתאם. The options are, are, are virtually zero. Uh, Gaza, the, the entire Gaza Strip, it is totally uh, uh, walled off by Israel on all sides and Egypt on, an, on, on one side. Both uh, are tightly controlled. Uh, needless to say, uh, Israel is not an option. I mean, leaving via the Israeli checkpoint is not an option. Even during Uh, normal times, very few people in Gaza uh, have permission to leave. Israeli defense forces say the emphasis is on damage, not accuracy. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu advising people to leave Gaza. But Israel also bombed the last open border crossing into Egypt this week. And for Gazans, there is no way of leaving. About the size of Philadelphia, the Gaza Strip was handed from Ottoman to British to Egyptian control until 1967, when the Six-Day War erupted. Israel seizing control of the Palestinian territories of Gaza, the West Bank, and Golan Heights. By the 1980s, as Palestinian anger over Israeli occupation grew, Hamas emerged as an offshoot to the Egyptian-based Muslim Brotherhood. One key goal of the militant Islamic group the eradication of Israel. Despite a brief period of peace, Hamas continued to assail Israel with suicide bombers and other deadly attacks. When they took control of Gaza in 2007, Israel and Egypt imposed a blockade that partially sealed off Gaza from the outside world. Today, with over two million residents, the Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated areas on Earth. Two-thirds of the population is under 25 years old, and 80% are living in poverty. With support from Iran, Hamas began launching periodic rocket attacks into Israel. Israel responding in turn with airstrikes and even ground troops at times. But tensions have escalated further recently, fueled by an increasingly right-wing Israeli government. Expansion of Jewish settlements on Palestinian land in the West Bank. Deadly raids against militants in Palestinian towns, and in particular, raids at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. It's one of the most holy sites in Islam, but also venerated in Judaism as the Temple Mount. We feel a lot of violence in our life. Uh, people burned, um, prisoners who received all types of tortures you can imagine. We are besieged for more than 17 years. All conditions here is bad, are bad. We don't have any chance to do anything. We don't have any chance to, to make life better. Last Saturday's bloody attack in Israel named the Al-Aqsa flood, bringing decades of conflict to a head and what could prove to be a critical tipping point for the region. What do people expect Gazans to feel? Gaza is literally a, a pressure cooker and uh, people are pushed into a corner. They've been pushed into a corner for the past 16 years. Gaza is now without power. Water, electricity, food supplies cut and overwhelmed hospitals that struggle to deal with the wounded. In seeking to prevent this kind of appalling attack ever happening again, Israel wants to wipe Hamas off the face of the earth. But as we've seen before, the actions of the few are unlikely to be stopped by the punishment of the many. It's now dark, again, dark again, night again, uh, terror again. I dream to Gaza to, to be free, to Palestine actually to be free. I dream that we all can come and go back to our homes Hopefully there is some resolve soon. Our thanks to Ian. Meanwhile, the fighting overseas has prompted a strong reaction nationwide, particularly from students on college campuses. Our Selena Wang joins us from Harvard's campus in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where there was a vigil held tonight for all of the lives lost. Selena, students there have gotten a, a lot of attention for their response to the conflict. Tell us what you're seeing there. What are students telling you? 
Yeah, exactly, Stephanie. We're actually at the silent vigil that's now just wrapping up. It was to mourn all civilian lives lost in the conflict. It was organized by the Harvard Palestinian Solidarity Committee. But because of all of the harassment that these students have been facing, the organizers actually required all students to wear masks so they are not identifiable. I've been speaking to students all day, and they say they've never seen the campus like this. There is anger, there is sadness, emotion, and fear. They say that the campus is divided and the tensions really mounted after the Harvard Palestinian Solidarity Groups released a statement that said the Israeli regime is, quote, entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. The statement went on to say that the conflict did not happen in a vacuum, blaming the conditions Palestinians have been forced to live in for decades. Now, since that statement, there has been intense backlash from prominent professors, from lawmakers, from CEOs. Some CEOs saying they want a public list of the students involved in these organizations that signed on so they can make sure that their companies don't hire them. Earlier today, we even saw a van with giant digital screens with the names and faces of students allegedly involved in the letter. But people, they are in pain on all sides. I spoke to students of the Jewish community who say that they are hurt, that some of their fellow students did not outright condemn the Hamas attacks. Take a listen to what the president of Harvard Hillel, which is the center of Jewish life here on campus, take a listen to what he told me. Jews are aching. Um, I know Jewish students feel unsafe and they feel uncomfortable and they feel betrayed. And I, 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 am, I, I honestly don't know. Like, how are we going to heal as a campus? How are we going to move on? I also spoke to Palestinian students who told me that they're in fear to leave their student housing, that they're scared to mourn in public. I spoke to one student who said that 10 of her family members have already been killed in Gaza. Take a listen to what she and her friend had to say to me. I just, I think that if I show my face or say something against Israel is at this time, I just, <laughs> the attacks are just, will be overwhelming. I can't be alone because I, feel like I'm dying. Like, imagine feeling like the place that you're from is going to get wiped off the map. The visceral reactions of the students here, not just reflecting the mood in campuses in this country, but also the general mood in this country. People are in pain. Stephanie? Selena, so many communities and campuses divided. Thank you so much for being there. And tonight we bring you more of our in-depth reporting on the ground in Israel and Gaza during our half-hour special brought to you by our reporting team of Matt Gutman, Ian Panel, and James Longman. We want to add some late-breaking news tonight out of Capitol Hill after Republican Majority Leader and pick to become the next speaker, Steve Scalise, abruptly announced he was dropping his speaker bid. In brief comments following a Republican conference meeting this evening, Scalise said that despite the fact that he is withdrawing from the speaker's race, he will remain as majority leader. Scalise has a majority of Republicans on his side, but not enough to win the speakership. Jim Jordan was the runner-up among Republicans it is unclear right now if he's their next and final choice. We still have much more to get to here on Prime. We've likely all heard the phrase, remember the Alamo, right? As we recognize Hispanic Heritage Month, learn how a new project is honoring the Latinos who fought in that famous mission. But next, a major request from the European Union regarding one of Elon Musk's companies, what it wants to know about the social media platform formerly known as Twitter. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The European Commission has made a formal, legally binding request for information from Elon Musk's social media platform X over its handling of hate speech, misinformation, and violent content related to the Israel-Hamas war. The move could lead to the first investigation of its kind in the EU under its new Digital Services Act, designed to protect users' safety online and stop the spread of harmful content.
In El Salvador, more than 4,000 security personnel are going door to door in communities on the outskirts of the capital to root out gang members as the country's president prepares to extend his emergency powers to combat crime. Since the president was first granted the powers in 2022, more than 72,000 alleged gang members or affiliates have been jailed. But critics say thousands of innocent people have been swept up in that effort. And according to the UN, more than 90% of the people killed in Afghanistan's deadly 6.3 magnitude earthquake were women and children. Taliban officials estimate more than 2,000 people died in Saturday's earthquake in the country's west, with many more losing their homes. A jury in Colorado has found one officer guilty of criminally negligent homicide and assault in the third degree death of 23-year-old Elijah McClain back in 2019. Another officer was found not guilty on three charges, including reckless manslaughter. McClain died after being stopped by police on his way home from a convenience store in August of 2019 after a passerby called 911 to report him. The prosecution argued that the two officers violated department protocol by using excessive force against McClain. A chance discovery inside the Alamo has historians rewriting history in San Antonio. ABC's Mireya Villarreal gives us an exclusive look inside the famous mission, showing us how a new project is honoring Latinos who fought alongside legends like Davy Crockett, James Bowie, and William Travis. Many believe the spirit of Texas was built on the battlefield that surrounded the Alamo the first of six Catholic missions planted in an area commonly known as San Antonio. The heroism of just a few hundred men spawning at least a half a dozen films. Like this 1960 Western, The Alamo starring John Wayne. Republic. I like the sound of the word. It means people can live free. And this 2004 rendition with Billy Bob Thornton. Names synonymous with the epic battle include Davy Crockett, James Bowie, and William Travis. But now the Alamo Trust is working to honor the other men, many of them Latinos, who fought alongside these legends with deep ties to Mexico, like Gregorio Esparza. We ask for any photographs of people's descendants that are directly connected to a defender. One of the early ones was Gregorio himself. It's really impressive because we had a forensic artist take all these images and make a painting. But our goal is we want to put a face on, on these men that fought here, one portrait at a time. Joseph Pache is a direct descendant of Gregorio Esparza, one of the men who fought and died at the Battle of the Alamo. He was considered a Tejano, someone that was born and raised in Mexico but later became a resident of Texas by choice, fighting for its freedom. I'm very proud for it and I bring that to my kids. We are Hispanics. Yes, we are Texans, yes. Well, I'm, we're Americans. It's important that we don't lose this heritage. And those other men stood right with them not as secondaries, but as equals. They were brothers in battle. The Esparza family is just one of several working closely with Alamo historians to make sure the stories of more Latinos are shared. The building where his portrait hangs opened just last spring. It's home to thousands of priceless pieces of history, like Davy Crockett's vest, Santa Ana's sword, and this chessboard that's more than 100 years old. Hundreds of these items were actually donated by English rock superstar Phil Collins, who became obsessed with the Battle of the Alamo as a young boy. The heart of this mission and the inspiration for so many of those epic battle scenes is the church. We got an exclusive look inside at the sacristy where priests usually prepare services, a room that's been closed to the public for almost seven years after a small fragment of color on the wall was noticed, a curating team meticulously shaved away eight to nine layers of paint to reveal an enormous discovery. Three fresco bands and an oval framed shape in the center of the two walls. So one little inch literally changed the history of the Alamo. Yes. The walls inside are so delicate, we aren't allowed to use our lights on the newly restored fresco paintings. 
The Alamo's conservator, Pam Rosser, led the team that spent more than two decades restoring the room. We're incredibly meticulous, and so we work one inch at a time, shaving away the layers. You don't want to go too deep, because then you're going to remove the fresco without knowing it, then you're able to make the discoveries of these frescoes that were painted. An immersive video plays on a screen that stands in front of the wall protecting it. A big part of our commitment at the Trust is to tell the full 300-year history of the site. How are you hoping these changes kind of translate to a younger generation that is just starting to learn about the history. There were Tejanos who fought alongside the Texians here. This was settled by the Spanish. So there's many ways to see yourself in the story of the Alamo. So much history at the Alamo. Our thanks to Mireya for that story. And still to come, we are going to talk about two women who are talking about the surprising ways they found out about their breast cancer. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and tonight we are talking about detection. Our Ariel Reshef has more. 27-year-old Olivia Franz noticed inflammation while breastfeeding her newborn, so she went to her doctor. They said, looks like mastitis, everything's fine, sent me home with a prescription for antibiotics. But after a week, Olivia knew something else was wrong. My breast was almost doubled in size. It was very red, very swollen. I started noticing some discharge from my nipple. She went back for an ultrasound and biopsy where they determined it was stage four inflammatory breast cancer or IBC, an aggressive breast cancer that doesn't always present with a lump. It had spread to my bones. I thought, well, I'm going to leave a brand new baby alone with no mom. And then my very next thought was that's not an option. He needs his mom and I'm going to do whatever it takes to keep myself here for him. Active and healthy, Meadow Bailey never missed a yearly mammogram. But after celebrating her 49th birthday, she got called in for a follow-up. I thought not a big deal. And the radiologist was looking with an ultrasound and she said, you know, we've got some area of concern here. I said, are you talking like cancer? And she said, yeah, I am. Meadow was diagnosed with stage one lobular breast cancer, a cancer that typically spreads and grows without ever forming a distinct lump. I never felt a lump and I also felt really good so it really caught me off guard. Both inflammatory breast cancer and lobular breast cancer are subtypes of breast cancer that typically present with unique symptoms like inflammation, changes in skin color, discharge from the nipple or dimpling. One of the biggest uh, myth or misconception about breast cancer is that it always presents as a lump. In fact, one in six females diagnosed with breast cancer did not have a lump at the diagnosis. In 2022, approximately 40,000 women in the U.S. faced a lobular breast cancer diagnosis. Inflammatory breast cancer, IBC, is rare and accounts for only 1% to 5% of all breast cancers. Both Olivia and Meadow receiving specialized treatments and breakthrough care at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. They said stage four is not a death sentence. Olivia 
Sophia, now going on three years cancer free. We call it survivorship. And Meadow, one year out, feeling lucky. I feel like I'm getting amazing care and I'm so appreciative for that. Early detection is so crucial. We cannot stress that enough. Our thanks to Ariel for that story. That is our show for tonight. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. Thank you. This is ABC News Live. It's the crush of family.